So, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me? Oh, praise God. Anyway, I'm happy to be in God's house. Are you? Whoa. Well, that's awesome. Okay, open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. I'm not, actually, I've I've taught Philippians chapter 1 and chapter 2. I will not be teaching chapter 3. And whoever's teaching chapter 3, I'm sorry, I'm going to steal some of your thunder today. Philippians chapter 3. Starting at at verse 12, our topic today is momentum, momentum. The Apostle Paul, speaking to his good friends at Philippi, and being very honest, which is how Paul was. He didn't mince words. Uh, You read Romans 7, you'll know what I'm talking about. It says, now that I've already obtained all of this, or have already been made perfect... But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us to all truth. We thank you, Lord God, that you're a God that is present. You're here. You say where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You make your presence known. Thank you, God, for the intimacy that we can share with you. Thank you, Lord God, that we can press in, Lord God, into your presence, Lord. While looking up, I pray, God, that you would just glorify yourself, open up our hearts and our spirits to receive what you would have for your church today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated if you can. I don't really try to get political. Not that I actually, I've, I've kind of changed my stand on that. I believe that the church needs to involve itself because so many people are just so ridiculously confused that they have a problem um, applying spiritual principles uh, to the secular norms, which are really quite abnormal, um, which are being pushed on them. Um, so every once in a while, I'll, I'll speak to certain things. <clears throat> And there's this one name, actually, that the many in society, the, the media, mass media, for sure, certain political parties, absolutely, um, had, have been trying to make as infamous as they can, and that's the name Donald Trump. So when, when you say the name, you know, people automatically respond however it is that they've been programmed to respond. You can say whatever you want about the person, I've made my position very clear. I, I hate when people say that, actually, when, you, when you're watching the news. You know, I've made my position clear, and you, and you absolutely haven't made your position clear. But, but I actually have. And so um, I, I, uh, I think you would be on a different planet if you thought his personality was particularly endearing. Um, I don't think that he has an endearing personality. And he says has a tendency of saying whatever's on his mind, and sometimes what's on his mind isn't particularly all that um, uh, coherent, uh, if you will. Uh, Not to say much of the other guy. That's a whole different level of non-coherence. But um, in terms of him, one thing we can say about him, and definitely after this week, we can say that the man has guts. The man actually went to my hometown the boogie down Bronx, all right, and he held a, a, a rally in the Bronx. The last time that a Republican candidate did that was in 1980. That Republican was a, a Republican by the name of, of Ronald Reagan. And uh, he went there and he was heckled, like heavy duty. He was surrounded, he was heckled. He infamously lost his temper, 
Okay, he lost his temper and he was screaming back at the people. They were kind of going at it. But ultimately, he won. He won, uh, he, he won the presidency and he won over New Yorkers to his side. Anyway, um, Trump uh, gave a speech to thousands of, of primarily minority um, voters, Latino and African American voters. Um, and it was generally inspiring, if you will, departing from his normally self-glorifying speeches. But one of the things that he said in particular, which is why I'm actually bringing it up this morning in my message, one, one of the stories that he used was particularly impacting to me. He, um, off the cuff, he started recalling a meeting that he had gone to when he was a young man, when he was supposedly at the top of his real estate game. He had gone to a meeting where there were 25 influencers and not, not social media influencers, guys that are, I would imagine, mega rich and um, really, really influential. He had gone to a meeting with them, and um, he got the opportunity of speaking to a man by the name of Bill Levitt, which Trump described as having been the biggest real estate person on the planet. Um, the man had gone bankrupt, um, and Trump was curious as to the circumstances, which is a, a, good, a good thing to do, right? Let's learn from other people's mistakes. Um, and so this is what he said, and I'm quoting. He goes, but I wanted to talk to him, referring to Bill Levitt. I wanted to find out what happened because he lost everything. Everybody knew it. It was very public. And I said to Bill Levitt, what happened exactly? What happened? Levitt then, Bill Levitt responded by saying, son, I lost my momentum. I had something going that couldn't be stopped, and I should have just stayed. I lost my momentum. And then Trump said, and I, I've never forgotten the term since then, right? I had something going on that, that couldn't be stopped, and I just let it go. Trump continued, and he said the following. He says, you, ha you, you have to always keep moving forward. And when it's your time, you have to know it's your time. Whether it's the famous words of Edmund Burke. Many of you have heard this quote before. All that's needed for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Or whether it's Mordecai's admonition to Queen Esther regarding her divine positioning for action when he told her in Esther 4.14, for if you remain silent, at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. God's going to do what he's going to do whether you want to be part of it or not. But you and your father's family will perish. Don't you think you're going to get away with it? And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Again, what God has started, God will finish so long as we don't step in and interrupt what he's doing. This is very interesting. We have the power to stop what God is doing. At least in our lives, God will continue to do it because his will will be done whether you want his will or cooperate or not, he'll still do it. But the problem is that we'll miss out on what God wanted to do in and through us. At the end of the day, doing nothing is a decision that comes with consequences. Sometimes the consequences are negative. As could have been the case if Esther hadn't followed Mordecai's advice. But other times, doing nothing could have extremely positive results, it was, as was the case when Israel was pressed up against the Red Sea. By pursuing Egyptians, they were looking either to re-enslave them or to kill them, and they actually see the army coming after them. They have a Red Sea in front of them. Things aren't looking very good. And then they immediately rise up against Moses and said, you know, couldn't we have died in Egypt? You brought us out here into the desert to die. They were put in a position 
where they could do nothing, but just because you can do nothing doesn't mean that God can't do something. And so Moses looks at the people and tells them, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today for the Egyptians whom you see today. You shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. There comes a time when you need to fight, but there comes a time where you need to be still and you need to let God fight. There are times where, as David said in Psalm 46.10, we just need to be still and know that he is God. Those that come to him must know that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who would diligently seek him. The key to our spiritual success is knowing the difference between when we need to be still and when we need to move. And once God has told you to move, you need to keep on moving until he tells you to stop. But to know the difference, we need to be sensitive to the voice of God. We need to be familiar with the voice of God. There are all kinds of lawsuits now coming up because of something called AI. How many have heard of AI? I saw an AI, uh, a, a, uh, a, they took a guy, an actor, and he actually comes off like Tom Cruise. I don't know, how many of you have seen that? It's not Tom Cruise, it's some other guy. But, you know, I think I've seen probably every Tom Cruise movie that's been out. And I looked at that video, and I was completely fooled. So what's happening now is that people are sampling people's voices. Computers are sampling a voice. And by sampling the voice, the computer can generate full sentences mimicking the voice of the person. This is like a computerized parrot. And the person will speak, and you will swear, you know, it's the actual person. But it's not. It's a computer. Let me tell you something. The devil knows how to mimic God's voice. So how do we know the difference? Well, you know the difference by being a servant of God, not a fan of Jesus. You need to have intimacy. He says, my sheep... Hear my voice. Are you a sheep? I know you look like a sheep, but maybe you're a goat. Some of us might be looking more like a cow, but that's a different story. My sheep hear my voice. And follow me. We need to be able to hear and discern the voice of God. You are going to be and are presently hearing all kinds of voices saying all kinds of things. The Bible says in the last days, people will bring teachers to themselves, having itching ears that will tell them what they want to hear. People who are, quote, unquote, saved will be fooled and will embrace the word of God says doctrines of demons. When you think of doctrines of demons, you think of something really evil. You know, you have like, a, you have like horror, whatever horror movies you saw when you were a kid, you come to your head. You know, I remember Thriller. Thriller. That's what you think. Anyway, obviously I'm older than many of you. So that's, that's what we think. But we need to be sensitive. We need to be sensitive to the voice of God because they're going to speak doctrines of demons. And what is that? Stuff that's going to sound right. It's going to seem correct. 
Can I, can I, can I take it a step further? It's going to appear biblical. They're going to spin it. I mean, to be honest with you, recently, um, I've been following, obviously, I follow all these legal things, and the last thing that most, I guess, any lawyer follows was his last Trump thing in, in New York, the quote-unquote hush money. How many have heard of it? Okay. The most ridiculous legal case in the history of mankind. Okay, the most astute legal minds on the planet can't figure out, and it's going to the jury, what the crime actually was. Are you hearing me? But how does it get to this point? It gets to this point because you can manipulate and kind of give the, the illusion. It's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like the a shell game. Let's just move the shells around so that you lose track of where the nut actually is or the, whatever you put... You, you put underneath the shell. And that's what the enemy is going to do. He's going to hide the truth. And he's going to promote lies that many of us will take for truth. But we need to be able to discern, especially now, the voice of God. And for that, we need to have intimacy with God. We need to, be, we need to have, be so used to hearing his voice that we really know who it is. You know what? If a computer called my wife with my voice, it might get over in the beginning. But I, I'm pretty sure that it'll come a point in the recording where my wife would go, wait a minute. How many know what I'm talking about? I'm pretty sure. Pastor Lee is from Brooklyn, man. She'd be like, okay, wait a minute. This is not, this is not my husband. All right. I don't, I don't know who this is. Sounds like my husband, but it, it's not my husband. We need to be so intimate with Jesus. We could say it sounds like Jesus, but it's not Jesus. Come on, somebody give God some praise. If God... If really the true voice of God is telling you to move, you need to move and to continue to move, as I said before, until God tells you to stop. Partial obedience will not only lead to loss of momentum, which will result in failure, as was with the case with Mr. Levitt, but but it's also considered rebellion toward God. If you decide to listen to God halfway, you know what the Word of God says? That's rebellion. According to the Bible, specifically when dealing with the sin of King Saul, when God told him to to utterly destroy all of the Amalekites, next thing you know, he's dragging Agag, the king, in. And you can hear the sound of sheep, which he decided were fit to be offered to God, even though God said utterly destroy everything, including them. Which, by the way, didn't make sense from a physical perspective. You know what? It doesn't need to make sense. When God tells you something, you need to obey what God has told you to do. Amen. I praise God that God is not, is not asking us to do some of the things he did in the Old Testament. Yes. I praise God that I was not Isaiah. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Because, I mean, that actually was the voice of God telling you to do that. I'm not going to go there, but... Just read up on what Isaiah was told by God to do, and, and you'll, you'll get where I'm coming from. But whatever simple thing it is that God is asking us to do today, we need to be obedient to him, and we need to do it completely. Because partial obedience is equivalent to witchcraft. The word of God says it's as the sin of witchcraft. Here's an important spiritual principle. If you're taking notes, write this down. In the things of God, you're either moving forward or you're moving backward. You're either growing or you're dying. Now, people will have you believe that that automatically means that you're growing numerically. And... and, and I think numbers make a difference because if not, the Word of God would not tell us that 2,000 and 3,000 got saved. 
I mean, why tell us these big numbers if it, it, it didn't mean to communicate something? You know, when, when God speaks, people listen. But you can grow wide and you can grow deep. And the latter is more important. It's important that we grow deep. Why? Because when we grow deep, then we become used to things like the voice of God. Then we can discern the will of the Holy Spirit. Then we can dif differentiate real truth from your truth or her truth or whoever else's truth you want to talk about, which by itself is the most nonsensical and illogical way of referring to the concept of truth, which is, of course, an absolute We need and must maintain our momentum in things of God. And in order to do that, we need to do a few things. I've narrowed it down to three because that's what preachers do. Number one, we need to move on. Look at your neighbor and say, move on. Look at him and say, move on already. Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect. This needs to be the starting point for all of us. We are not all that and we're definitely not perfect. As stated by the English poet Alexander Pope in his poem and essay on criticism, when he says, and we've We've read this a million, million times, to err is human and to forgive divine. As humans, we make mistakes. We are born in sin. And if that weren't bad enough, we then go ahead and sin voluntarily. The Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 3, in verse 10, he says, For none is righteous, no, not one. In verse 23, he goes on to say, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Most of us won't be unfamiliar when I mention a name, a name, a, a name the name Jason Bourne. Um, if you're a guy, you know that name, okay? Um, we learned rather quickly that he was pretty messed up to begin with and had made some pretty poor choices right up front. And then consequently, in all of the Bourne movies, Born Identity. I, I had no idea that there were that many Born movies. Born Identity, Born Supremacy, Born Ultimatum, Born Legacy. I mean, and th there are a couple of more. But, but one part of the story is the same. He's, he's living his life, doing his thing, and he's made out. They, they, they discover him. And as soon as, he, as they discover him, he needs to move. He needs to move on. He needs to get out of there. Staying in the same place means certain death. Why? Because his past continues to chase him down in every single movie. Similarly, our mistakes follow us. And when they do, Paul tells us what we need to do. In the second part of verse 12, he says, but I press on. Look at your neighbor and say, press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus took hold of me. We press on. We don't stop. We don't take a break. If we fall, we get up again. And we what? We press on. Where you've been, maybe you have some, some, some things you think are good memories. It's amazing how the devil, how we fall into the devil's delusion. I remember once in church, there was a woman that was complaining about her husband, you know, and her, her husband was all sold out for Jesus, and he was, he was going to church, and he was, he was really involving himself, himself in the things of God, and the wife actually said that, that she, she, she liked him better when he was hooked on crack or whatever he was hooked on. Because I guess he was sitting around the house just falling over or something. 
What a delusion. What a delusion. Our past will catch up with us. And when it does, and when it begins to instill fear in us and to distract us from our future in Christ, that's the point, just like Jason Bourne, where we need to move on to what God has called us to do in the first place. That's when we need to stop meandering around in our spiritual walk and get serious about what God has commanded us to do, and that is to build his kingdom, no matter what the cost. Contrary to popular belief, and I need to clarify this here, you and I are not called to build the church. He said, I will build my church. We're called to build the kingdom. And when we build the kingdom, God will take care of building the church. If we stay where we are, are you listening to me? If you stay where you are, you will die. There's no such, I mean, you know, some people have this, that's what happens to churches. People are in the same church for 30, 40 years, right? They lost all concept of evangelism. Ain't nobody new coming to the church, right? The chosen few. Kids get to the point where they go to school, they go to school, they never come back. Why? Because the church has lost its, its kingdom vision about saving the lost, about reaching out, looking out from itself into the outside. The church doesn't grow from the inside out. It grows from the outside in. And we need to understand that it's a principle. Goes on to say, but I press on, and if you have that verse, Just highlight, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I I highlight, to take hold of that. I want you to notice that God says here, take hold. He asks us to take hold of something for a purpose. We don't just grab at anything and everything that's put in front of us. Like I said this past Tuesday, just because it's in front of you and it's good doesn't mean it's God. Paul is specific in his letter to the believers in Ephesus. And he narrows the scope of God's work in our individual lives. He tells them and he he tells you and me by extension. Ephesians 3.10, for we are God's handiwork. And then he goes on to say the following, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. But he doesn't leave it there. If you were just to do good works, any good work, he would have just stopped the sentence right there and put a period. But no, the sentence doesn't end there. He says, created in Christ Jesus to do good good work, comma, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has things that he's chosen you to do. The problem is that you and I choose to do a whole lot of things that we choose to do, but God has not chosen for us to do. And you know what we're doing? We're wasting kingdom time. A whole lot of people spending all kinds of time building the church, reading books, listening to podcasts, how can, I, how can I expand the church? How can I grow the church? There are churches that are going wide, man, as far as the eye can see. They're building the church, but they're not building the kingdom. I remember being in a prayer meeting with Pastor Jim Cimbala, a Brooklyn Tabernacle. Man of God, humble man, when you... When you meet him personally, you realize just how humble he is. 
And you know what he said? His greatest fear is that all those thousands of people that come to his church, that, that he would be in heaven and there would be a, just a few of them in heaven. What good is if I gain the whole world and lose my soul? What good is if, it, if I have success and gain the accolades of man? And when I get to heaven, God would say to me, depart from me, I did not know you. But, I, but in your name, I... A lot of people use God's name and they do so in vain. But to take hold of that, whatever your that may be, we first need to press on. We need to move on. That takes us to an important spiritual principle, and that's that distancing yourself from your past. If you're taking notes, this is a good one. To, this is one of your Instagram moments. <laughs> distancing yourself from your past is part of the process of moving on in Christ. Distancing yourself from your past is part of the process of moving on in Christ. If we're going to look back, let's do it just so that we can find where we need to put our foot down to push against whatever it was and, and, and move toward where it is that God is leading us. We need God to give us clarity. If we're going to look back. Let's look back on so we would find out what it is that we need to rebuke, what it is that we need to bind, what it is that the devil's trying to use to drag us back, to hook us. The sad truth is that many of us can't and won't move forward because we refuse to push against our past. Why? Because we take comfort in our past. Because we make fun of the people in Israel when they talk about the onions that they left in Egypt. I love onions, I love onions and garlic like the next guy, man. I, I love onions. All right? But I don't think that an onion is going to cause me to want to be in slavery. They forget that they were crying to God, deliver us. Unless it means leaving the onions. What is it that, 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 that the enemy uses? Let me tell you something. And this is important because when we get people saved, when people get saved and they're babies in the Lord, we need to help them forget their onions. Oh, man, that's good right there. I don't, not in my notes. But we, I think it's a good way to remember it. We need to help them forget the onions. The onions were good. I don't care how good could the onion have been if it was dragging you to hell. If it was robbing you of your peace and of your joy and of your honor. If it was compromising your walk and destroying any possibility of having intimacy with Jesus. So right if I preach, is that all right? <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know God is speaking to somebody today. Look at your neighbor and say, drop the onion. Drop the onion. Basta. Basta. We can't afford to, to waste any more time in our past. Time is not replaceable. I'm a grandfather now. I got my little guy. Okay? But I don't know, ever since I had my little guy, time appears to be moving faster. Maybe I never noticed it before. But with his little life, man, he could be talking gibberish one day, and two days later, he's, he's coming up with sentences. He understands what he's saying. Time is moving. David said in Psalm 39, For show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. We got a little time. The question is, what are we going to do with that time? Last week, I, 
I mentioned while preaching, while teaching Philippians 2, how sometimes we're worse than kids. That's what Paul says. In our complaining and our infighting. We're like the kids in a long trip torturing our Heavenly Father with the all too familiar phrase, are we there yet? The answer to the question, at least as far as our spiritual lives are concerned, is no. We're not there yet. Paul makes that clear in the second part of verse 13 when he says, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. No matter how together you think you have it, trust me when I tell you, you don't have it all together yet, and neither do I. Which brings us to the next move we need to take. We need to move on, but then we also need to move up. This is the essence of Paul's teaching to the church in Colossus. He tells him, Colossians 3, 1 and 2, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. You're a new creation. You got to be careful where your heart is. Where is your heart? Set your heart on things. You, you, don't, you, you can't lose your heart. Anybody here lose their keys? Raise your hand if you lose your keys. Anybody here lose their glasses? I'm going to walk around with my glasses on my head trying to find my glasses. You know, the problem is with us is that we're so into whatever we're into that we lose our hearts. Now, where is that heart of mine? I, I thought I left it here. You find your heart is meandering. It's, your, heart is, your heart is out on the street. Like Bugs Bunny with, with, with fishnet, you know, stockings. That's where your heart is, out there, outside. (laughs) Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Your heart and your mind need to be higher than the rest of you. We need to be seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Our hearts and our minds not only need to move on, they must move up. They need to be synchronized with God. That's exactly what Paul meant for us to do in his first letter to the Corinthian church. Chapter 2, verse 16, when he says that we are to have the mind of Christ. Let me put it another way. If we claim to be Christian, our lives should reflect and not contradict the fact. How we talk, how we walk, who we hang out with, who we're best friends with. You can't live like you lived in the world and expect to, and, and expect to, to project a transformed life. We're not who we are, we're going to be, but we're definitely not who we were. That same God who started the good work will end it so long as we keep moving. Are you hearing me? From glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. When you stop, you stop when he tells you. You, you stop when you reach glory. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication, let no dirty talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Remember Remember when I told you about your heart, losing your heart? The Bible talks about your heart and your mind. We need to be careful with our mouth. My mouth is my, like, it's my perimeter alarm system. I don't know how, how your mouth is to you, but 
Sometimes I'll say certain things, right? It'll come out, you know, it comes out without you thinking. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No sooner do the words come out of your mouth that you get a check in the Holy Ghost. Can I hear an amen? And then you're like, okay, where did that come from? Where did that, that came from the pit of hell. That's where it came from. And it came out of whose mouth? It came out of your mouth. You know why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So here's the problem. I'm speaking crazy stuff. What's in my heart? But you don't have to worry about that. You're saved. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Search my heart, O oh God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me to the path everlasting. Lord, I need your help. You know why? Because it sneaks in. I don't care how long you've been serving God. In fact, the longer you serve God, the more apt you are to be careless. And to allow all kinds of stuff to begin to sneak their way in. You know why? Because you've been in the company so long that you think you're authorized to give it a pass. You be winking. Don't worry about it. It's a, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You're like a bouncer at a club letting people come in. Yeah, don't worry about it. Come on in. Letting all kinds of junk come into your life. And then you wonder, why can't I have, you know, uh, you know a, a strong relationship with the Lord? What do you have? In your heart. What have you let in? It's come time for us to dispossess some things from our heart. To speak to certain things and say, you know what, you need to get out of here. You don't need to speak nice to the devil. You need to show him the door. Oh, but you let me in. I know I let you in. The same guy who let you in, he's the one who opened the door. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. This house belongs, the lease belongs to Jesus. Are you hearing me? I don't need a notice to quit. I don't need an order of removal. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. Whatever has come in, move it out in Jesus' name. He tells the believers in Corinth, who though they exhibited the gifts of the Spirit, had some serious problems. 1 Corinthians 5, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even sit to eat with such a person. That's pretty crazy. But what, I, what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? The word judge there comes from the Greek word krino. It means to separate, come to a choice, a decision by making a judgment, either positive verdict in favor or negative to reject or condemn. Continuing, Paul breaks, down, breaks it down further into some simple steps. He starts by saying, it says, but one thing I do. It's really a few things in one set. One thing I do, the first step being forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what is behind. What does it mean to forget? It doesn't mean that you have amnesia. What it means is not counting the past against yourself or others and then moving on. It means Forgiving others and also doing something that is way more difficult to do, and that's forgiving yourself. We can easily forgive other people, but sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. And that's what the enemy uses to keep, to keep, keep us bound. We have a God-given ability to learn, and as a result, we can change. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. Which is why the Word of God, through the Apostle Paul, tells the believers in, in, in Colossus, chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these things in your life, in the life you once lived. I want you to notice something. He says, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. It says, you know what he says? It says, which is idolatry. How is it that those things are idolatry? Because you're putting them before God. They matter to you more than God does. We try to, we try to excuse it. We try to accommodate it as a weakness. Imagine if we did that to our wives or husbands. You play your wife dirty, your, your wife finds out, she calls you out on it, and they tell her, honey, I'm sorry, it's, it's just a, a weakness that I have. It's weakness. Weakness. Your wife be like, that's a sofa, and that's a door. Take your weakness out the door. But we expect God to be good with it. We want to hit God. He just changed and contoured himself into whatever shape we want him to take. He's a shapeshifter. No, he's a Lord God of all flesh. There is no shadow of turning with him. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He won't change for you. He won't change for me. He won't change for nobody. And that's the whole point. He's not here to conform to our image. We're here to conform to his. We forget the past, and then what? It says, and straining toward what is ahead. Straining is not just pushing against something. Straining is what happens when you take your body beyond its natural limit. Anybody do weightlifting? A couple of people. Amen. Praise God. I love you, man. So here's the thing with weightlifting. You know, and some of us, if you have a trainer, you know, you, you have a love-hate relationship with your trainer. In the beginning, you love them. And then as it gets more, as you get more into it, you begin to despise him. Especially when he says the following words. One more time. One more time, your mama. I'm putting this down. No, come on, you can do it. One more time. One more. Ah, ah, ah. You know why? You know why you're freaking out? Because you're busting yourself up. Because forget about the first time, 10 times you picked it up. Now, your body's giving up on you. Your body's telling you, you bust me up, that's on you. That's why the next day, after a quote-unquote good session, you struggle with lifting up your coffee cup. Yeah. <laughs> why? Because you strain. Same thing happens in the spirit. We strain towards God. And you know what? Things become difficult, but don't worry about it because God will pick up that coffee cup for you. Come on, somebody give God some praise. Paul says to the Ephesians, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be careful, be smart. Make the most of every opportunity. They don't grow on trees, dude. If we're going to grow, we need to hustle for God. We need to allow him to break us down so that we can grow stronger. We need to do what we feel we can't do in our natural strength so that his strength can be made perfect in our weakness. We need to move on. We need to move up. And lastly, we need to move in. 
Preparing sermons and, and teachings have been a spiritual journey for me through all my years. I've been doing this for a really long time. And I've learned that powerful preaching and teaching can only come from having a real intimate relationship with Christ. From having a relationship that hurts. What do I mean by that? Well, you're so in love with Jesus that when you do your foolish thing, it breaks your heart that you did it. Having a relationship with Christ where you go out of your way, not because you're being told to, not because the rule book says you should, but because you love him so much that you're going to strain, you're going to bust yourself up, you're going you're gonna to allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever needs to be done on that potter's wheel over the, the lump of clay that is your life. So that you can become that vessel of honor that God can use for his glory. Best story that we can use on this is found in Luke 10. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him. She came to Jesus, asked him, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to, tell her to help me. Famous words of Jesus. Martha, Martha. Mario, Mario. Susan, Susan. Carlos, just put your name in, whatever your name is. You were worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, and indeed only one. A whole lot of things take your peace. You get upset in two seconds, Martha. But only one thing is needed. See, you think you need to do all this stuff for me, that's, and that's... That's cool, but you know what? You're missing out on what's important. He says, Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen what is better. And that's exactly the choice that we need to make. It's great to work for God. But we will be the most productive when we first allow God to work in us. The book of Isaiah has, when you, when you read in the, in, the, in the 20s, even before then, you see Isaiah calling out punishment on one country after another. In chapter 30, God rebukes Israel because of their futile confidence in Egypt. Because they had gotten comfortable with Egypt. And they were going to Egypt for advice. Who is the church going to for advice? Who are you going to for advice? God is bringing judgment on them because they're going to the wrong people for advice. You know why? Because they want to get advice that pleases their flesh. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, Isaiah 31 and 2, who take counsel but not in me, and who devise plans the, the word plan, devise plans there in, in Hebrew, the term is they weave a web. They weave a web. But not of my spirit. All kind of sticky stuff. But not coming from me. That they may add sin to sin. Who walk, walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice. You don't need my advice. You got your friends with you now. Telling you what you want to hear. Verse 12. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel. Because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity. And rely on them. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fail. A bulge in a high wall. Then it says whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. 
It's a bulge. It's growing. It's growing. It's growing. The water's still on the other side, but it's just a matter of time before it blows up in your face. Pretty scary stuff. I was reading that, and I'm saying, wow, this is, this is crazy. And then when you get down to verse 15, the Lord tells them, and us by extension, how can, we, how can we be saved from this? How can we be saved from this? You know what it says? And again, follow what I'm saying. We're living these half-hearted lives for the Lord, allowing things to sneak in. Those things, those things that are sneaking in are building and bulging. The wall, is, is, is the pressure of the stuff that we're letting in is pushing up against it. And it's, it's going to burst and it's going to bring destruction. The question is, how do you stop it? Good question. It says, for thus saith the Lord God, of, God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Go back to the ancient paths. Return and rest. What does that mean? Have confidence in the Lord. Not in your machinations, not in your skill set, not in the plans, those fancy plans. You know what? They don't mean a thing. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. Listen to this. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. In quietness. And confidence. You know, the Word of God says we need to be as little children to be saved, right? Unless we're like a child. What does that mean? When you're a child, right, you have confidence in your parents. When you were eight years old, were you worried about how the rent was going to be paid? You didn't even know that there was rent being paid. You want to know who stole my matchbox car. That's what you want to know. You want to know. You want to know. You know why? Because all that stuff was taken care of by your parents. And to a large extent, you were happy. You were happy with your, your matchbox car or your Johnny Lightning or whatever it is that you had or your doll, your Barbie, whatever you had. Because the rest of it was taken care of by your parents. But then you became an adult. Just saying that is a downer. Am I right? Just, just, you know, you became an adult. Oh, yeah. Now you have to pay rent. Okay? Now you have to do all those things. And it, 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 can, it can feel... Like the world is coming to an end. It could feel that way. But you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to trust the same God that you trusted when you were a kid. He wants, he wants you to go back to that place of rest that only comes in Christ. The world can go crazy. But if you're a child of God, it will make no difference to you. Why? Because I know in whom I have believed... It may not be the way I plan it. It may not look the way I want it to look. Let me tell you something. God will not necessarily give you what you're asking for, how you want it. That doesn't mean that God isn't working. You know what's funny? It ends up that the way God wants it is better than the way you wanted it. You only find that out later on. Because you're thinking this is the best thing since sliced bread, man. But the truth of the matter is, is that God has something so much better for you. Are you hearing me? But we need to be still and know that he is God. We need to be patient. We need to be patient. We need to trust him. That he will answer when we need the answer. And he will answer how it, we need to, how it needs to be answered. The Old Testament never has the word faith. You, you cannot find the word faith 
We're faith people, you know, we're people of faith, right? But never once do you find the word faith in the Old Testament. There's another word that's used. The word is trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understandings. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He'll set you straight. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we thank you.